In the Gospel of Luke, we have two chapters dedicated to the birth of Jesus Christ. The foretelling of it to Elizabeth, first of all, and Zechariah, that they would have a child, John the baptizer, who would come before Jesus. And then Elizabeth was going to be a sign, was going to be a help to Mary, that when Mary gets similar news that she was going to become pregnant miraculously and she was going to have a child, that her cousin Elizabeth would, uh, would be six months pregnant when she gets to her. And that would be a sign to her to help her to grasp that. And then chapter 2 that we just read a moment ago gives us Mark or Luke's wonderful details about Caesar Augustus and Quirinius and the taxing and, and all that went on. Matthew's gospel tells us about it from Joseph's perspective. When Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, they're not married yet. They have not had relations yet. Something's up here. An angel comes to Joseph and explains to him, Joseph, it's okay. Take Mary home as your wife. And then we come to the Gospel of John. And in this short verse, we get John's version of the Christmas story. It goes like this. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word. The Word became flesh. Pray tell, what are our promises made of, but of words? Christmas card I received from one of our patrons at the food pantry says this. I love it. Every time a hand reaches out to help another, that is Christmas. Every time someone puts conflict aside and strives for understanding, that is Christmas. Every time people forget their differences and realize their love for each other, that is Christmas. Christmas is really all about promises. It's all about promises that we make. But most importantly, there are promises that have been prompted by promises that have been made to us first. A number of them we read about just a moment ago as we went through the Christmas story again. And throughout this time in Advent, we've been talking about our promises too. Promises like to buy presents, which we've done. Many of them have been exchanged already. But also to be present with each other. Promises to send cards. Some of you have done that already but also promises to send peace in the way we deal with people. Promises to share cookies. We both got some of those last night. Those are very good. They've been shared and eaten, but also to share joy with each other. Promises to wrap gifts, probably some of them frantically last night and maybe even a few more this morning. You don't have to tell, your secret is good with me, but also to wrap people in love. Promises. You promised I promised, but most importantly, God has promised and kept that promise. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's God's word to us. It's that word that comes in that, in that crazy phrase that God says to the serpent that I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve at that time. And the promise that one day from the line of Eve would come one person, he, a man, who would crush the head of Satan. And he does. Why? Because God keeps his promises. And because it's all wrapped up in that word. In the earlier part of John's gospel, John will say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he starts out that gospel that, by saying, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. You see that Word again. That, that Word of promise. That just as powerfully as God said, let there be light. Spoke it with his words. And of course there was light. That just so when God would say, with his words. And then later on, with his Word, who is Jesus Christ. That he would come. And he would be the Word of God become flesh for us. In creation, beginning with the word, and now in winning our salvation, using the word. And he would do what? That word would become flesh. He would become human being for us. God himself, as crazy as it sounds, would become a human being, born, and born in that little manger, placed in that manger, and born to live a simple carpenter's life, and born to begin to teach and, and to wow those who were in the temple, the teachers in the temple, with what? With his words, with his answers. That word would become flesh 
for us. Why? Because God promised. Because God said it would be true. And that word would not only become flesh, but he would literally dwell among us. His presence would then be never-ending for us. So that the greatest promise ever made would be fulfilled at Christmas. And we'd celebrate that. And of all places, God would bring that greatest promise to us through a family. Through the families. When I think back about the, the greatest promises I've ever been given and kept in my life, it's come through family. Through a mother and a father who faithfully raised me, they fed me, no matter how much it took for a while. They loved me. They provided a shelter over my head. They educated me. And they most importantly brought me to Jesus. First of all, at the baptismal font, where I became a child of God, as many of you did, and then brought me around that word. So that every time I hear the songs of Christmas, and every time I hear the story of Christmas, I say, I got that. I know that. I've said that before. And it's true. God has kept his promises. So when I think of the who of promises, the, the one who's kept the greatest promise of all, I come back to God. And God always keeps his promises. God is always faithful to his promises. So when I come back to God, and you do too, and I confess my sins to God, and I say, God, I've messed up. God, would you forgive me? I know what he's promised. When I come to God and I say, God, I feel like I'm so very much alone and, and, and nobody else is around me and I'm struggling, I know I've got that promise that I'm with you always and it never Will I leave you or forsake you? When I wonder about those who have gone before me, when I think about my own end of my life too, and I wonder what will happen there, I go back to the promises. I go to prepare a place for you, the word is said to us. And in my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And the promises go on and on and on. And Christmas reminds us that those promises are not just for a select people, but they're for all people. They're for all who know him as Lord and Savior. And that, my friends, is the greatest promise of all. So whether it's a promise fulfilled that we celebrate again today, or whether it's promises that are coming true today, or promises that will be coming true down the line, we know that a promise is a promise with God. And at 100% of the time, he will deliver. He is Emmanuel, just as he was promised. He was born to a Virgin Mary. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born to be a servant. He was born to suffer. He was born to die. He was born to rise. All by the promise of God. And he would be called the same name that we call him yet today. The same name that's near and dear to our hearts the one that means he will save, and that is the name Jesus. And so we promise too. We promise people today that we will get together with them, maybe even, maybe even last night too. We promise some maybe a little further down the line. We'll find that day if it didn't work out yesterday or today. And we promised. We promised St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Chicago that we'd be faithful and help them out at their soup kitchen. We promised the chaplains of our troops in the military, that we would send off care packages, and many of them received those stockings that were filled with that food. We promised the two churches in Alaska that we would be there for them, that we would pray for them, that we'd support them with our, some of our mission dollars, and sometimes with ourselves physically present. We said to Deaconess Lori Wilbert, we will be there for you, Lori, and we will support the ministry uh, 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 that you do at the prison. We promised Applewood Nursing Home and Brookdale Retirement Home that some of us would be there, Darlin included, comfort dog. And we promised the people of this community that our food pantry would be open on a regular basis on Saturdays and sometimes during the week when people call. And that is where this card came from. Because you see, when you keep God's promises, then God keeps his promises to us. That nothing that we do in his name, no matter how small it might seem, ever goes in vain. But he always accomplishes his promise, 
We plant, we water. He makes it grow. And one day, one day down the line when we're in heaven, we'll hear from the words of our Lord. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came and you visited me. And we will say, Lord, when did we do that? And he will say, as I promised to you to send you a savior, as I promise to forgive you, as I promise to love you unconditionally, as I promise that I prepare a place for you in heaven, then I've been faithful to you. So blessed, promised, trustful, gracious, merciful Christmas to you. And may the promises of God continue to ring in your hearts and in your ears every single day, that every single one of those promises he has, is, and will be fulfilling. And may we be people a promise as well. Whether it's through something like our food pantry, or in those little things that you do every single day, knowing that God promises that everything in his name is never done in vain. I promise, God promised to you in his name. Amen.